All right, welcome back to Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019-2020 Lecture 32, Introductory Lecture on Dante's Paradiso, Cantos 14 to 18, The Sphere of Mars, slides 150 to 171, let's ascend from the Sphere of the Sun to Mars. Now, from this, my, from this sight, my eyes recovered strength to raise themselves, and I saw I had been translated with my lady alone to a higher blessedness. I saw clearly that I had risen higher by the glancing smile of the star, which seemed to me redder than ordinary. 1482 to 87. Welcome to the heaven of Mars. The heaven of holy orders. All right, so some facts about Mars before we get into the uh, details, or, or rather into the philosophy of it and the people that we're going to meet. So first and foremost, it is the fifth of ten spheres of heaven. It is the second sphere outside the uh, uh, the scope of Earth's conical shadow, and thus it is not marred by any sin. You will notice that um, the uh, starting with the sun, there are four straight spheres that have cardinal virtues ascribed to them. Just as the sun had prudence or wisdom with the very wise theologians and teachers there, so does uh, the sphere of holy warriors, the sphere of the Mars, have courage, bravery, or fortitude as its virtue, as you might imagine with warriors who happen to be holy warriors. What do I mean when I mean holy warriors? Uh, uh, one, one of the people who we will be talking to in Mars, the person we will be talking to, the Shade, is actually a crusader from one of the, I believe, 11 crusades. I'll look it up to make sure that's correct, but I think that is the right number. Uh, recall that crusades were attempts by, generally cap, by Catholic Christians to attempt to take back Jerusalem, which was called the Holy Land from a Muslim occupation. And there was a lot of, uh, and there were 11 crusades over uh, hundreds of years, and so that was obviously uh, something that took quite a bit of time. In any case, notice also that we are going to go from Cantos 14 to 15 to 16. 16 has that number 6 in it, so there will be some political element, just like in Canto 6s down in uh, the Inferno, Paradiso, and Purgatorio. Um, here, we will, um, here we will meet... Uh, a, an ancestor of Dante's named Caccia Guida. His name actually means Guida, like Guido uh, uh, del Duca or Guida Guinizelli or Guido uh, Cavalcanti, guide. Caccia means the hunt, so he is a guide to the hunt. And what he is going to guide Dante to is sort of a perspective on what his destiny is. He is going to show that events do not simply happen, but there is some providence to them, that there is some end to be fulfilled, that even though something terrible is going to happen to Dante, which he first had uh, mentioned to him in Canto Six of the Inferno by Chiaco, uh, his exile, that there will be some purpose for his exile. And so there are also um, uh, uh, hearkenings back to the conversation in Book Six of the Aeneid between Anchises, dead, and his son, Aeneas. So Caccia Guida will here be in the place of Anchises in the underworld, or the overworld in this case, giving information about the future of Dante to him, just as Anchises gave uh, to Aeneas information on the future of his people, on his descendants um, uh, in the Aeneid. And so there are correlations, again, between the Aeneid and this text. And so Virgil continues to find his way into heaven without actually literally making his way into heaven. Um, Caccia Guida, just so that you know, lived 1091 to 1148. I will soon have this on the slide. He was in the Second Crusade, and he served under the Emperor Conradin. Uh, one of the themes here of this text will be that conflict and suffering can produce harmony. And remember that the liberal art that is ascribed to this sphere is actually music, where you take discordant elements, which are different, Notes of differing sound, or excuse me, notes that are differing uh, uh, notes, A notes, B notes, C notes, D notes, they sound different, and differing lengths, they're half notes, quarter notes, uh, rests as well. And you put them together, and instead of just making a jumble or a cacophony, they make a harmony. They all seem to work together. Part of uh, the theme of this text will be that um, it is internal conflict or factionalism within groups that leads to its own corruption. So perhaps factionalism within your own soul. Your desires and your intellect do not work together. Factionalism, as we saw within the Christian church, we recall that there were differing orders of monks that we talked to who shared their perspectives in the sun. St. Bonaventure talking about St. Dominique, even though he was a Franciscan. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas talking about St. Um, uh, Francis, even though he was a Dominican. Yeah, showing that even though they 
came from different factions, they worked towards the same end. Or we're going to have a political version of that in this text. That when factions arise not only in religions, but within political states, they cause uh, schisms within those states. All right. So the theme, as I said, is uh, conflict and suffering can produce harmony. Now the shape of Mars. Recall that these next four spheres, starting with the Sun, ending with Saturn, each take shape because Dante's vision continues to clear, which might make you think the interesting question, which, uh, do you think the Moon and Venus and Mercury all had shapes, but Dante's vision had not cleared enough in order to see it? I think that would be a good question. I can't answer it. In any case, what is the shape of Mars? Well, it's two intersecting lines, lines which intersect at right angles and bisect each other. That means that they form a cross, a crucifix, a holy crucifix with who at the middle? Uh, Jesus. So all these souls together, and uh, this is what it looks like, seem to form a cross going vertical, going horizontal, with an image of the divine in the middle. And we'll have to talk in seminar about what we think that means. Well, this seems to be a metaphor. A metaphor for harmony is produced through struggle and effort. These um, two lines intersecting with each other are in a similar way to two circles intersecting each other, representations of convergence on a point. Two people with two different perspectives meeting at a single truth. And so we'll have to see how this particular spirit with this cross emphasizes uh, the point that was begun in the Venn diagram-like interlocking circles of the sun. And it will do uh, very well. And this should say Kacha, Guida, not Kacha, Guai. Though, of course, Guai is the translation of, uh, of Guida, or Guido. Uh, in any case, remember this. Dante's guide in this canto, or excuse me, in these four cantos, uh, because Kacha Guida will have quite a bit of time to speak, is uh, his great-great-grandfather, so not his direct father like Anchises was to Aeneas. And so he, he is a little, little uh, deeper rooted in history, and there will be good reason for that, not only because of his name and its etymological resonances, but because of the time that he lived in Florence. You will hear soon that he lived during a golden age of Florence, when things were good, when people did not wear uh, far too expensive clothing and have houses which were too big, when men did not go off to France to sell their goods to make exorbitant amounts of income. And when, even in the city itself, the uh, city still had its Roman architecture or, or city planning, and all the streets were at right angles to each other. Over time, Florence would be built out beyond its original wall to another wall to another wall, where um, and the streets would uh, eventually not be at right angles. And this is sort of seen as an overgrowth in Dante's mind. That, um, Things have gotten too complicated there. Things have gotten too messy. They have lost their original simplicity and order. In any case, uh, do I want to talk about... I'll, I'll just very quickly mention this. So an, an attempt at an allegorical understanding of the cross here might be this. Is it a symbol of the intersection of the divine nature and the human nature in one place? That of human consciousness. And so you recall from the symbol of the griffin that uh, the divine nature and the human nature, that uh, Christ had two natures all in one. Again, one of those paradoxes, like how can three equal one? How can something be immortal and mortal at the same time? How can he be fully human and fully a god? Well, the idea is that he was. And well, a cross is an intersection of two lines in one place, sort of like how a divine nature and a human nature could intersect in one place. And what would they produce? Well, an allegorical understanding here is that they could produce what was produced in man when he learned to think, consciousness. And well, what does consciousness allow for you to do? Well, it allows for much more than pain. It allows you to suffer. And suffering is expectation of future pain. And that means that you have to be able to see the future, which means that you have to see with more than your eyes, which means you have to see with your intellect and have an intellect, which means that the birth of consciousness is also the birth of suffering, but also the birth of the virtues. Because which theological virtue allows you to suffer something for something more valuable than yourself? Charity. So, that is a, one allegorical way to interpret the cross. That is a representation of human consciousness, that humans can suffer, and that you can choose to suffer for something that you believe is uh, worth suffering for, or even potentially worth dying for. You are able to give charity the ultimate gift because you can deal with the ultimate uh, suffering or because you, you actually must endure the ultimate pain, which is suffering. I think that's pretty interesting. In any case, 
So those starry bands composed in the depths of Mars, the venerable sign, that means the old sign, which diameters crossing at right angles make in a circle. That is a very fancy circumlocuitous way of saying that a cross is made. All right. Now, a couple more things about this, uh, this sphere. The star is redder than ordinary. It is red. It's red for good reason. There are multiple reasons. Originally, red, of course, would have uh, 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 made us think of ideas of potentially anger and rage, like fire, or like blood and blood being spilled, an image of violence. But recall also that the Christian appropriation of that symbol uh, has red become the symbol of charity, the idea being that you spill blood for things that you care about because you have the luxury of consciousness. Uh, luxury, I say somewhat ironically in that moment because, of course, you're suffering. Beatrice, again, becomes more lovely. So notice also uh, that as we ascend the heavens, not only does Dante's vision clear and he see things more clearly, but Beatrice gets more beautiful. It's, if you were to understand her as an allegory and not simply as a character within the text, but as a symbol for something more, perhaps she would represent either his own mind and how beautiful it is getting, or how his ideal is becoming clearer and more beautiful. As if he had seen a castle in the distance very vaguely at first, but as he comes closer to it, he sees it in greater detail. And in seeing that greater detail, it becomes more beautiful to him. Hmm. All right. Recall that the souls form two lines which interconnect at the center and make a cross. Christ shines at that center. We said allegorically that could represent the human capacity to suffer and therefore give charity for something uh, that they're willing to suffer for. So to use their freedom to suffer, to give up something of value of themselves for something they value higher than themselves. And that uh, holy war or divine conflict is also in some way represented by this cross. Uh, the place of endless humus, human suffering voluntarily taken off. So a cross is made up of two lines. As you know, lines go on forever. They never end unless they're line segments. And so the idea is that humans, insofar as they exist forever, will suffer, and they might as well suffer for the right things. So in a way, uh, and I think that's very interesting, uh, all humans, in all ways, are always uh, uh, consumed with some form of holy war, in that they are trying to figure out what is worth suffering and dying for. And perhaps that is the ultimate goal of a life. What is worth dying for if you know you're going to die and you are on the clock. All right, allegory aside, let's get back to the facts. There is music in Mars, but it's still hard to hear. We can't quite get to decipher all of it. And I think that's so interesting because when you do listen to music, do you hear all the words the first time that you hear it? Or do you like hear some of the words and make out some of them and sometimes even make up some words? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's how it starts when you first hear something. Well, the hymn is beautiful, but unclear. Have you ever liked a song and not known the words to it? Yeah, of course. And Dante hears arise and conquer. So very bellicose words, belligerent words, warlike words. Arise and conquer. Uh, Vici, Vini Vidi Vici is very famously said in Latin by, uh, by, uh, by Caesar. I came, I saw, I conquered. The canto's final line, 14, because we need to get through 15, 16, 17, uh, and into the beginning of 18, is because as one rises, the holy joy becomes clearer. All right, well, good. That answers the first question that we asked today. Is it the case that the higher Dante goes in heaven, the, clear, the clearer things become, or the clearer his vision becomes so that he can see things as they truly are? It is the fact that his vision is clear. Things in heaven are as they are. But he is learning to see them correctly. Recall, this goes all the way back to our first discussion in the heaven. And he was talking to Picard and Donati, and he said, well, you're in this low heaven, and there are these other top, higher heavens. Wouldn't you want to be in those? And she says, well, you, you just aren't looking at things right. Uh, there aren't actually a bunch of heavens. You just see them in that way because you see things in a human way. You're still uh, bound by your human perceptions. But when you see things as God sees them, you'll see that there's actually a unity where you see disunity. Okay, cool. Silence is then imposed on this sphere in Canto 15. It's time to talk. Time to meet someone. Time to meet someone very important, the person that I talked about. And a, in lines 13 to 21, a comet-like soul bursts forth. And there are two major resonances that you need to know from this. There's a historical one and a mythological one. A mythological one that actually happens to come from a, a poem that we know well, the Aeneid. There was a comet mentioned in book two of the Aeneid above the head of Ascanius, the son of uh, Aeneas, 
which got Anchises, who we'll soon be talking about quite a bit, uh, to leave Troy when it was falling. He said it, he thought it was a symbol that indicated that there was hope in the world, some sort of uh, meteor crossing the sky, uh, tremendous portent. And he decides, instead of dying, to continue to live. Unfortunately, he still dies in Book 5 anyway. That, so that in Book 6, he can uh, tell uh, Aeneas some things that he would not be able to say when he was alive, because he has access to future vision, hyperopia, when he's down in the underworld. In any case, there was also a comet, historically, at the funeral of Julius Caesar, which Augustus Caesar used uh, as a symbol. He claimed it was a symbol from the gods, indicating that the soul of Julius Caesar had ascended to heaven, and that Julius Caesar was therefore a god, and that therefore Augustus Caesar was the son of a god, and was therefore justified in his rule because God had justified his rule because his father had been a god. Which is a very clever political thing to do. If you can happen to become, say, the ruler of a nation, and then see some odd sign that people can't explain and don't know the meaning of, and you claim that it makes you the uh, descendant of a god, perhaps people will think you are even more of a ruler. In any case, the Anchises connection is directly made in Latin. So the first three lines that are spoken by Kashaguita, curiously, are in Latin, not in Italian, which is what this text is written in. And the first three words of the three lines are actually words that come directly from the Aeneid, that are spoken from Anchises to Aeneas. O sanguis meos, o super infusa gratia dei sicut tibi qui dis unquan quaeli janua reclusa. And it starts with, O oh my blood. He's indicating that they are what? If you share the same blood as I do, we are what? We're family, we're related, yes. Their family. And I think that's very interesting. Oh my blood, oh super infused grace of God. As to you whom have ever the gates of heaven been twice opened. Alright, there's a lot to say here. Dante is going to meet his ancestor here and he's going to take quite a great pride in him. His, his ancestor lived during the golden age of Florence. His name is Cacciaquita. His ancestor was a crusader. His ancestor died on a crusade and is therefore a martyr and ascended straight up to heaven without having to go through purgatory. That's the great thing about being a crusader. Suffer on, uh, suffer on earth, don't have to suffer in the afterlife. Something interesting about this. This crusader great-great-grandfather is going to talk about how factionalism is the root of... Uh, the, the fall, the, uh, how do I want to put this, the degeneration of Florence that has happened up to and through Dante's time. But the first person we met in the Inferno who really cared about family ties was himself in Canto 10, Farinata, himself a Ghibli. And I, I will have an interesting story to tell about him. I might tell it immediately here. Recall that Farinata, the first thing that he asked of Dante was, who was your family? Who is your blood? And we saw that as an error of his perception. That uh, what is most interesting, and this is what we've been learning all throughout the Divine Comedy about somebody, and what is most important about them is not their religion, is not their job, is not their, uh, is not their political faction, but is their character, their choices. And we saw that as um, sort of a problem with the perception of fairy knowledge. But here we'll notice that Dante actually takes pride in his family as well, just like fairy Nata did. And he will actually find this to be a, a somewhat curious event. Because in, there is an appropriate level of pride that you can take. In any case, uh, who was just mentioned? Who has had heaven open for him twice? Well, there is a character from biblical theology, and we had him mentioned in the first two cantos of the Inferno. Uh, I am not Aeneas. I am not Paul. St. Paul supposedly was twice received in heaven. He had a vision of heaven. Supposedly he is the one who wrote uh, so many of the epistles that make up the New Testament, one of the major writers of the New Testament alongside the four evangelists. In any case, all this is to say that the speaker Cachuita, just to say, uh, once more, is obviously related to Dante as his great-great-grandfather, and I think this also adds to why Mars, or this sphere, is red. Not only red because of the blood of sacrifice, but because this sphere will talk about the value of blood and sharing blood with people as well. Alright, so Cachaguita begins by explaining that Dante thinks he is reading his mind. And he is. Possibly because all of these characters within the Paradiso are within Dante's mind, as the poet and the pilgrim, uh, which I say cleverly. Uh, but why does Cachaguita take special joy in seeing Dante? Well, Dante, he heard before Dante opened his mouth what his will or desire was. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know why I'm saying that. In any case, uh, but I 
I do know why I'm going to say this next piece. He gives a very nice uh, metaphor here. He, before he addresses who he directly is, he, he roots himself within the history of Florence. And in fact, he roots himself within uh, the history of Dante's people. He says, you are leaf to my root. You are a branch on my tree. I come from the same family tree that you come from. And if he is root to the leaf of Dante, well, what comes first, roots or leaves? Roots, of course. You have to go back to your roots. Exactly. The roots that go underground, which is all the more appropriate because obviously Cacciaguida, who has died, has been buried where? Underground. Yes, exactly. And Dante, who is still alive, is part of the living, uh, uh, the, the part of the tree that still gets to see the light of day. The branch and then the, or sorry, the trunk, then to the branch and then to the current leaf. Uh, such are the lives of man. Just like the scattering of leaves, just as Glaucus tells us in Book Six of the uh, Iliad. Hmm. In any case, Cacciaguida, like I was saying before, came from a time when Florence was great. Like Anchises, who lived while Troy stood. Now that's a very interesting connection, right there. Anchises lived during the height of Troy. Cacciaguida lived during the height of Florence. Aeneas lived as an exile during a time of turmoil. Dante, as we know, is obviously about to live. Like in exile, even though this poem itself takes place in the year 1300, we know that Dante historically will be exiled in 1302. And surprise, surprise, he is going to learn about that exile and the meaning of that exile from his, uh, from his great-great-grandfather. <clears throat> and so, is Dante here receiving a mission from his great-great-grandfather? Is he in some way going to find that he, like Aeneas, could be a holy warrior? Could he somehow find something that was missing from his people and imbue it back into them? This is uh, part of what we talked about yesterday with the seminar questions. How can he pursue civic virtue if he is himself outside the city? Well, I'll give you a small hint. Um, a little history about the Guelph and the Ghibelline divide. Recall that Dante is a Guelph and then a white Guelph. And that the white Guelphs are expelled from Florence in late 1301-1302 by French forces sent by Pope Boniface VIII in order to support the Black Guelph claim on the city. But remember, there's an even bigger fight between not only the Black Guelphs and the White Guelphs, but the Guelphs themselves and the Ghibellines represented earlier in history by Farinata. Well, how did that conflict first start? Well, there was a guy named Juan del Monte, and he had an offer of marriage from a young lady who happened to be related to the Ghibellines. He then uh, reneged on that and accepted a, a marriage to another woman who was higher in rank and was thus subsequently, for that betrayal, killed by one of the Uberti family. Uberti, like Farinata Uberti. And that's why uh, Farinata is so keen on Ghibelline claims because one of the founders of the Ghibellines was his uh, ancestor. And so I say all of this just to show you that Dante has been enmeshed in these conflicts between wealth on wealth and Ghibelline on Ghibelline. That means that he's been the solution to the problem or part of the problem himself. He's been part of the problem. He's been part of the rotten fruit. And so when he's exiled from Florence, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the fact that he's exiled strikes him as bad. But if he's part of the problem, it's actually what for the city? Good. And then, once he's outside the city and no longer part of the problem, he can perhaps analyze what the problem is. Factionalism, whether it be in the church or like between Bonaventure and, uh, and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, or in the state, like between the Guelphs, Juan del Monte, and the Ghibellines, the Ubertis. Now he can stand outside the city and reflect the corruption or show the corruption for what it truly is. I think that's beautiful. I think that's brilliant. All right. And remember also that, oh, this should not say three, that it is uh, actually Conrad II that, uh, that uh, Cacciaguida dies under in the Second Crusade, so one of the earlier Crusades. And so he existed during a time when the Pope acted rightly, the King acted rightly, and soldiers fought for right, rightly, uh, instead of people fighting amongst their own families and against each other, as they do in Dante's time. As even the Guelphs have split against each other and are fighting against each other. And bringing in foreign troops to fight for them, in the case of Pope Boniface VIII, uh, introducing uh, French 
truths into the conflict. And so things have gotten messy. Dante is very proud to be Cacho Riva. And in fact, he shows this in a very interesting way. And I, I suppose you, you should know this. Um, we didn't focus much on Pope Adrian V, but uh, there are five characters in the Divine Comedy who are greeted with the respectful wa form, like the respectful vosotros form in Spanish that is so rarely used uh, these days. Farinata was referred to with the wa form. Brunetto Latini, his old teacher, uh, and there are resonances of Brunetto Latini here. We'll call it. He was in uh, 15, in front of 15. We are at this very moment uh, moving from uh, Paradiso 15 to Paradiso 16. Pope Adrian V, Guido Guinizelli, his old friend, but still do, uh, still, uh, I'm forgetting the second word, the still, uh, the sweet new, oh yes, the swill, the still dolce nuova, uh, and of course, uh, Cacciaguida. So, Farinata, Brunetta Latini, Pope Adrian, Guido Guinizelli, Cacciaguida. Now, Dante is very impressed by meeting Cacciaguida, and he is very polite to him. He's so polite that Beatrice actually gives him a smile, like, oh, you might be over doing it just a little bit. So, Dante then asks for an account of his ancestors' ancestors, and Cacciaguida describes first uh, Dante's and his direct ancestors, and then the former notable families of Florence during its glory days. This is modeled after the speech Anchises gives to Aeneas down in the underworld in the Aeneid, where he tells the history of first the Trojans and then the Romans. Uh, this is how things were when they were good, and this is what has happened over time that has made things bad. He tells him his personal history and the history of his city so that he actually knows who he is. In knowing who he is within the context of the city, he can know whether he is actually a good element or a bad element. And in this case, he's actually going to find out that the thing that happens to him exile will end up being good because he has been part of the poison that has been poisoning his city, which is a very bitter pill to follow for him. In fact, uh, uh, Dante will explicitly say he will be or rather, Cacciaguida will say to Dante, so the poet Dante will say, not the pilgrim, that uh, he will learn uh, how steep the steps up to another person's home is, how salt the bread is in another's house. And uh, there are actually a couple of interesting things about that. Uh, you may not know this, but in Florence, they don't salt their bread. And so some people, some scholars think that that's a comment on that. The other reason is that, obviously, salty bread has resonances with tears. It's bitter. It is bitter to eat the bread that is given to you by someone else that you have not paid for. And uh, just a third connection to that, I just saw an article yesterday that says, you don't know how much salt's in your bread. You get a lot of sodium from bread. So know that we actually do salt our bread quite a bit. That's why bread uh, tastes so good. Um, in any case, he concludes with a nostalgic harking back to days of peace with these people. And I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to have to go very fast. And with others... And others with them. I saw Florence enjoy such peace that there was nothing for which she had to weep. Sounds great. With these people, I saw her inhabitants in glory and justice. Very different from how Dante describes the avarice, the, cupi the cupidity, and the envy of the Florentines of his day. So that the lily, Wells, was never turned upside down. That's also the symbol of Florence, the Florida lake, was never turned upside down on the flagpole which is obviously a mark of something being evil, sort of like the Satanists will turn the crucifix upside down, indicating that they have inverted the values of Christians. Well, it's the same thing with a political state. And in fact, if you play chess, what you do to indicate that you have forfeited and therefore lost is you turn your, you, uh, you uproot your king. You turn him upside down, essentially. Was never turned upside down on the flagpole, nor through divisions. Again, divisions that we've been talking about. Stained red with blood, and not red again. Strange sentiment. Talking about Florence, Florence's time of peace, don't worry about writing this. In the sphere of war, remember that Florence's patron god was, ah, uh, yes, you should know this, was Mars, before he was replaced by the Christian patron saint John the Baptist, who was himself killed. And so I think that's very interesting that uh, originally when the city was a pagan city, they worshipped Mars. But now as a Christian city, they worship John the Baptist. Uh, they worshipped a god who was known for killing and conflict, literally described by the epithet bloodstained, stormer of strong walls, and manslaughtering in the Iliad, and with a man who uh, 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 supposedly baptized Jesus, though he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and later had his head literally served on the platter. Um, <laughs> Alright, um, that's where we have to pause today, because we just don't have any more time. We'll say more when we have more time.